Good afternoon. I hope that everyone can hear me sufficiently well enough. I am beyond humbled to be in your presence this afternoon. The voice that you just heard is a voice that I first heard as an intern at Parkland. And I have gone from having that voice strike terror to having that voice evoke love. And I do mean that in the most sincere and heartfelt way. Any of you who haven't had an opportunity to engage with Dr. Wilson, please avail yourself of that moment. One of the beautiful things about medicine is that we actually identify our lineage based on those persons who helped to shape us to become the persons that we are now. And when you have an opportunity to spend even a few minutes with someone like Dr. Wilson, I promise you the effect will be long lasting and it will be an effect that you will pass on. So I am delighted to accept the invitation and thank you for the generous introduction. Let's talk about heart failure. I realize that the audience is mixed. There were things that we could have done today that would have described some translational science we're involved in. There are things that we could have done today that deal with some leadership issues that we continue to navigate in Chicago at Northwestern. But one of the things that we do for the community at large is to help articulate how best do you provide care for the patient with heart failure? I needn't tell you what the burden of that condition is. But I also need to remind you that whereas a number of years ago, we had very limited options, we have many more options now, and our new therapies are coming forward at a very rapid rate. And so we have the opportunity to really restate, redefine what it is we understand about this condition. I have no relevant disclosures. I have no relationships with industry. So you can feel as if the comments I'm making to you come from a lens that is mostly academic, but also involves some editorial responsibilities. Let's begin with the basics. I'd like to take just the first few minutes, particularly with the presumption that there are house officers in the audience and say, this is what you should know. And this will only take several minutes to articulate what you should know. First, what's the definition? We have over some period of time now curated a concept that we define heart failure as patterns of left ventricular dysfunction measurable as the ejection fraction that are associated with certain clinical phenotypes, phenotypes which then prompt specific therapies, therapies that have been explored and a host of randomized controlled trials. In 2013, the iteration of the guidelines that we chaired came forward with a novel concept. We thought that there was more than just reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection heart failure, but that in fact in the group where the ejection fraction was preserved, we felt as if there were two important components, both within the space of an ejection fraction between 40 and 49. Specifically, one group that has experienced recovery from a previous measurement of very low ejection fraction. I'll get to that in just a few minutes. And another group where the ejection fraction happens to be in this mid-range. We wanted to try to understand more of that process. What we did was something very different. Deliberately, we wanted to use the guidelines as a platform to incite more investigation so that we could understand more about these particular phenotypes. The next thing we did in 2013 was for the first time, we bifurcated stage C. What you see before you is the template that really captures our best understanding. You can see that it marches from left to right through the stages of heart failure. And then from top to bottom, it goes through the prototypical patients and importantly identifies those evidence-based therapies that will modify the natural history. But for the first time we bifurcated saying that it is important to discriminate our thinking and our treatment decisions according to the best evidence guided by studies done with the very low ejection fraction, less than 40%, or the preserved ejection fraction. Note that I didn't say normal, greater than 50%. We came up with this algorithm. This algorithm is necessarily complicated because we have more therapies that are effective. The algorithm said specifically this, take a picture, that's obligatory. If the ejection fraction is reduced, this algorithm applies. It is again obligatory 
that unless there's an absolute contraindication, ACE inhibitors, evidence-based beta blockers, diuretics is needed to control symptoms. After which we created this model that has six scenarios. These scenarios are not mutually exclusive. They all can be applicable at the same time. One goes through a thought calculus with each of the scenarios that prompts a therapy that is evidence-based. And once the model is constructed for a given patient, that then becomes that patient's best iteration of guideline-directed medical therapy. And only after we've been through that exercise do we progress to think about the other issues. We understand the complexity of this. And so when we reconvened in 2017, we realized we needed to make this easier. And so we came up with this app. This is from the American College of Cardiology. Again, it's industry supported. It's intended to make the thought calculus easier. So this is Treat HF. It's available in Google Play or the Apple Store. But it allows you to go through a series of interrogatories. Those interrogatories will query specific details about your patient and then prompt you to consider evidence-based therapies and give you a link to the evidence base that says those therapies are most effective. So if you've not made a habit of looking at this particular app as a means to understand what constitutes evidence-based therapy for a given patient, please avail yourself of that. More recently, we've done a much better job now of thinking about who is it that really is at risk for having this condition. This is a contemporary heart failure risk prediction score developed at our shop with the support of Don Lloyd-Jones, but with one of our young investigators, where you can input, again, relevant data that are known to be risk factors for heart failure, identify those patients at risk. We have derived this score and validated it, and now we have a funding request before the National Institutes of Health to test interventions to see if we can forestall the development of heart failure by applying a rigorous score. But what about for HEF-PEF? Again, for the fellows and the residents, this is a brilliant score. And I like to emphasize this score because it was created by Dr. Reddy. Dr. Reddy created the score at the Mayo Clinic. So as a fellow, he was able to identify a scoring algorithm that helps you understand the pretest likelihood that a patient has heart failure with preserved. Imagine the benefit of having these risk prediction tools where you can anticipate who's likely to have heart failure, or you can anticipate who's likely to have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Whether for the purposes of research or therapy, these are advantages that we didn't have before. They're publicly and readily available. For the house officers, I would argue that you should make this a part of your strategy when you approach a patient. Maybe it's because I'm now older, or maybe it's because this is the right approach. But no comment about heart failure is appropriate if we don't talk about prevention. I want to be emphatic and make this very clear. We can fundamentally prevent the majority of cases of heart failure in contemporary medicine. And I'll show you three of the ways we can do that. First, by the exquisite guideline-directed control of blood pressure, we now have incontrovertible evidence that controlling blood pressure in those patients at higher cardiovascular disease risk, not everyone with hypertension, but those patients with hypertension and increased cardiovascular disease risk profile, when their blood pressure is exquisitely controlled, we reduce the incidence of new onset heart failure sufficient to require admission to a hospital by 40%. The next thing we can do, and I will emphasize this later, is really embrace this newest science, looking at the sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors and the first signals that now are strongly encased in evidence that we can fundamentally prevent heart failure, particularly in the diabetic patient. That is remarkable. And when you partner that with the fact that these drugs also reduce the incidence of CKD, which has been the scourge of the diabetic patient for some time, we all 
not just endocrinologists, we all should be facile with the science as we understand it behind these drugs and the best application. And then the third way that we can prevent heart failure, and maybe this is apropos for someone born in Louisiana who spent a lot of years in Texas, lifestyle matters. The lifestyle to which I was acculturated is not a lifestyle that is friendly to the heart. There is no mystery about why we see so much heart failure across the South. But if you can incorporate a heart healthy lifestyle, there is clear evidence, not antidote, evidence that we can reduce the incidence of heart failure. So particularly for the house officers, if you glean nothing else a few minutes with me today, walk away with the fact that we now have algorithms of care to help us treat and prevent heart failure, particularly with reduced ejection fraction. There are unique statements that need to be made about women at risk for heart failure, whether it's reduced ejection fraction, particularly thinking about chemotherapeutics, or preserved ejection fraction, thinking about obesity. We should be cognizant of what's necessary to prevent heart failure in women. One of the efforts that I've been deeply engaged with has been trying to optimize the implementation of guideline-directed medical therapy appropriate for reduced ejection fraction heart failure. We've done all of this work, but the evidence says from the discovery moment to the full implementation moment, it's a 17-year time cycle. That is too long to realize the benefits of these evidence-based therapies. Colleagues of ours went forward with the CHAMP HF registry. This really was a bellwether moment in heart failure because it demonstrated that in sophisticated practices where practitioners knew that a quality assessment was being made of the care they were providing, for patients with a clear indication for guideline-directed therapy without contraindications, these were the findings. Only 25% of patients with a clear indication were on one drug in each of the three big categories for heart failure. And only 1%, 1% approximated the doses that were proven to be beneficial in clinical trials. It's very easy to sit back and hold fast that we know how to treat heart failure and that we're able to respond when queried about the best approach. But it's another dynamic altogether when we have to implement execute and really treat our patients in the best possible way. So these CHAMP HF data have been sobering, but they've been important for us to promulgate so we can remember that it's, we are, it's necessary for us to optimize therapy. Why is that? These data from the approved HF data set are very compelling. Let me outline this for you. If you look at the response to the exposure to evidence-based medical therapy measured as the nadir of the N-terminal pro-BNP biomarker survey, what you see is something quite remarkable. When the nadir is less than 1,000, as seen here and here, the two panels represent either death or hospitalization plus death, it is remarkable how much discrimination there is in outputs between an effective change in the nt BNP signal and one that is absent. That is further highlighted when you look at these data and see that particularly in those patients that go from a high biomarker profile to a low biomarker profile, seemingly in response to exposure to guideline-directed medical therapy, their response ultimately is if their biomarker profile was low to begin with. Point being is that there's not any secret here. When we treat patients more effectively, we now have a biology, a biology that says we are reducing left ventricular wall stress. And in turn, we're seeing an improvement in cardiovascular disease events. And so the substance of this is to be very assiduous in our deployment of evidence-based therapies because we recognize that markers of ventricular function, whether rejection fraction, in diastolic, in systolic volume indices of markers of diastolic function all get better. And so there is a science that argues that it is correct to optimize medical therapy, not because we're trying to meet some arbitrary threshold from a trial, but because the biology says we actually
improve the substrate, and that in turn leads to better outcomes. I've had the privilege over about 20 years of having a close collaborative relationship as investigators with Greg Fonero, who's now the chief at UCLA. We talk no, we talk no less frequently than once every, every other day about it. It seems like we speak to each other more than we speak to our, our spouses. But one of the things we've done over the years has been to try to understand what would be the benefit if we did all the right things for the patients with heart failure at the right time. And we've now added the SGLT2 inhibitor to this list. And you can see the remarkable change. Let me just have you look at one category. Look at two year risk of death for heart failure for just on diuretics, calcium channel blockers. Still the way some patients are treated. A 35% chance of death at two years versus less than 10%. That is remarkable. That really changes the narrative for all the people that say there's not much you can do about heart failure. It's to fail completely, the patients will not thrive. We argue stridently against that. If you deploy evidence-based therapies correctly, you see the outcomes. So that is the first thing I wanted to convey, particularly to the house officers, so you can understand where the state of the art is. I wanna take you through a couple of thought experiments now and say, what are the unanswered questions? And one of the really important unanswered questions is this, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This picture is nearly ideal, so it probably should be a woman. The typical patient is now a woman who comes in older, heavier, dyspnea, and has heart failure symptoms. The key association here that is typified when you see the concomitant presence of visceral adiposity and an enlarged liver, if you will, non-alcoholic steatohepatosis or fatty liver disease is a pro-inflammatory signal. We believe quite substantially now that this pro-inflammatory signal generates a biology that largely intersects with the nitric oxide homeostasis pathways. And that in turn leads to the vascular dysfunction seen in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So when you look at the construct now, thinking of it as a function of aging, taken together, all of these variables really lead to stiffness within the myocardium, within the periphery, loss of cardiac reserve, and leads to the symptoms that we describe as heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, many of you know full well that we've exploited the use of the RNA compound that is neprilysin plus an angiotensin receptor antagonist, specifically Valsartan. That's in the setting of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But we were enthused to see the initiation and completion of the trial in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction using the same model. So Paradigm HF was heart failure with reduced DF. This is Paragon. The biology is as you've become familiar with, we know that there's a duality of effect here, blocking the effects of angiotensin II, upregulating the many multiple effects of the appropriate presence of natriuretic peptides. But does that work in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? What was the study design? Much like Paradigm HF, there was an open label run-in and a crossover. Then there was a double-blind randomized treatment period in those patients that could tolerate both the ARB and the combination therapy. The primary endpoints, heart failure hospitalizations and death, a number of important secondary endpoints. And the key inclusion criteria become uniquely important. Remember the definitions that I gave you. Heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, EF greater than 50, but we had this category between 40 and 49. The investigators either deliberately or by committee assignment accepted an EF down to 45 for enrollment in this trial of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. That turns out to have served us quite well. These were the results. We all know the top line said that the study was not a positive trial, but it was an incredibly informative trial. And had there been six events that have gone a different direction, this would have been declared a positive trial. Again, for the house officers, a p-value of 0 0.059 is not statistically significant. This uses a frequency counting effect. But it has been assessed 
that what this number really tells us is not the strength of the effect, but the certainty of the finding. There's a difference between the effect size and certainty. What this really says is that there are six chances out of 100 that this is due to a random play of chance. Meaning that there is curiosity that there's something to be learned here. What might that be? Well, first it shows that the signal was predominantly in hospitalizations, not death. But more importantly, when we look at these subgroups, and in this case, it's not unreasonable to look at the subgroups because many were pre-specified. I want you to see, first of all, the cluster of outcomes all line up in favor of a treatment effect. So this really was a near miss if there was such a thing. But more importantly, and this is where things become very intriguing, I've deconstructed that subgroup analysis to these important subgroups. The first one is as a function of gender, male or female, and the second as a function of ejection fraction, with the midpoint being greater than or less than 57%. Now, why do we do this? I want to remind you that half of the patients in this particular trial were women. So the usual critique that women were underrepresented in the clinical trial does not apply to this. This is a relevant sample size from which we can make a reasonable set of observations. So let's begin with the data thinking about women. Here the data are discriminated. And this is from John McMurray's presentation in November at the American Heart Association. You see on the left, the data for women, and on the right, the data for men. Now this is a continuous plot of the hazard ratio, and the line of identity is the red horizontal line in each of the four plots. The two top plots are the primary composite, the two lower plots are total hospitalization. I want your undivided attention to pay close attention to an important observation here. For women, the continuous plot of the hazard ratio, these are the confidence intervals, doesn't cross the line of identity until the ejection fraction is at least 60%. 60%. Meaning the potential of a treatment effect here. For men, it crosses the line of identity at about 50%. If you now look at total hospitalizations, it replicates the same thing. So the question that I've placed parenthetically is simply this. Is this a statistical play of chance? Or could there be some truth in the idea that when we're thinking about heart failure, ostensibly with preserved ejection fraction, but particularly in women, is there reason to believe there could be a difference? So let's explore that further. We believe that there might be reason to consider that there's a difference. Let me remind you that we already know full well that heart failure with preserved ejection fraction generates a muted response in the biomarker profile. Wall stress is distributed differently with a thicker ventricle. And we know that there's an inverse relationship between obesity and the generation of NT pro BNP. We know from previous clinical trials that women enter those trials with a higher BMI. So if the first premise is that HEFPEF may be a BMP deficient state, and the second premise is that those that are obese have an even lower threshold of a natriuretic peptide, it does intrigue. That intrigue goes deeper when we understand what pathways we're trying to excite when we give neprilysin. We're trying to upregulate the natriuretic peptides, and the activity of the natriuretic peptides is mediated through the soluble guanine cyclase or receptor bound guanine cyclase. And what is receptor bound guanine cyclase? It's the BMP receptors. They actually generate a signal in cyclic GMP that leads to the production of protein kinase G. Now, it turns out that estrogen augments that cycle leads to an upregulated production of nitric oxide. And in the postmenopausal woman, that cycle, that signal, is less robust. The woman makes less enos, has less vascular pliability. And so now you have three issues. One, HEFPEF is a BMP deficient state. Two, 
BNP is inversely related with obesity, and women enter these trials at a heavier BMI than men. And three, particularly postmenopausal women, they may have unique downregulation of nitric oxide, arguing that if that particular phenotype received a therapeutic that especially upregulated the production of nitric oxide, would that not be a benefit? And then finally, what about the measurement of ejection fraction? When I was still at UT Southwestern, we started the Dallas Heart Study, a very appropriate longitudinal clinical, clinical observational series, not a trial, that was intended to define the progression of cardiovascular disease in a racially balanced cohort. Part of what was discovered is that regardless of any comorbidities, women consistently have higher ejection fractions. And so now you've got a much more intriguing model. Remember the subgroups of importance, the EF response in Paragon up to an EF of nearly 60%, particularly in women, and then uniquely the response to women. So you can see what the normals were in the Dallas Heart Study. So we would argue then that it is not just to play a chance. It is not proven, but it is possible that women may have mounted a response to augmentation of naturopathic peptides in this study. Now let's think more carefully about the ejection fraction since we've just thought about women. This was a remarkable observation. It really made all of us stop because if you look at the point estimate, it's the truly normalized EF greater than 63 where we see nothing. But in the group with the ejection fraction between 50 to 57, we see a point estimate that looks very intriguing. Again, is this a play of chance or is this real? Scott Solomon did a brilliant job of bringing these data forward. Scott combined the low EF study with the ionic compound paradigm and the higher EF study paragon. And now look at these point estimates starting with hospitalized heart failure and cardiovascular death, cardiovascular death, et cetera they all line up to suggest a treatment effect in both trials. So what does that mean? Well, again, if you do the continuous function plot of the hazard ratio, it really does argue that there is a signal from very low ejection fractions all the way through about 50 when the confidence intervals get broader. But if you make this gender specific, where women are in red and men are in blue, once again, you see this observation that looks like it's durable. The women respond as if they have reduced EF heart failure all the way up to an ejection fraction of the mid 50s to 60 or so. This really is disruptive because it says everything that we've tried to articulate in the guidelines that limits the response of evidence-based therapy to a reduced EF characterized by something less than 40% may need to be totally reassessed, particularly from a gender-based basis. So this is an area of really prominent research. John McMurray and I shared the same stage at the AHA to present these data to the community at large. And what I wanted to really point out was that even if you took a conservative point of view, thus the purple arc that I interjected on his graphic, it would suggest that for women, we have to consider ejection fractions up to 55% as being responsive to evidence-based therapy for reduced EF heart failure. That is a wildly provocative hypothesis. It's not a tenant that's proven, but imagine how that changes the way we approach patients with heart failure. If we now consider EFs up to 55 as the target for these evidence-based therapies. Part of what I enjoy doing, in fact, early this morning, I was doing such, serving as deputy editor for JAMA Cardiology, and it's exciting to see ideas come to our desk and be considered for publication. But when we saw these data in September, we were really quite intrigued because maybe the time has come that ejection fraction alone is insufficient to describe ventricular performance, particularly as a way to articulate what therapies patients should receive. So let's go on to the next unanswered question. I told you I would get back to the sodium glucose co-transport porter two inhibitors as potential 
disruptive therapies and cardiovascular disease profiles. We published these data some number of years ago and made the assessment that perhaps what's going on is that these compounds change myocardial metabolism. That is still a work in progress, still a theory. We don't have the mechanism completely resolved, but we know that there are renal effects. We know that there are cardiac effects and we think that affects energetics. But what really was interesting were these data. These were the first clinical data for the SGLT2 inhibitors from the Impera trial. Because the FDA mandated that any new diabetic agent had to demonstrate neutrality on cardiovascular events, these data were captured longitudinally and inexplicably was identified was this, a striking difference in hospitalizations for heart failure. Was that a quirk or not? Turns out that's very real because when all three of these drug classes were looked at in aggregate, a colleague of mine, Mark Sabatine, did this analysis and published it in January of 2019 in The Lancet. When you look at the data with empagliflozin, the pagliflozin and canagliflozin, all three major SGLT2 inhibitors, the data are exactly congruent. There is clear evidence either with pre-existing atherosclerotic disease or in the absence that there is an effective reduction in the incidence of heart failure, and this qualifies as a preventive strategy. What's happening here? Well, the biology is simply elegant, meaning that we really don't know. But it's not just based on glucose lowering. This is a very provocative model from a set of investigators in South America who have argued that the mechanism really does have to do with myocardial energetics. They ascertain the following. In the normal state, the SGLT2 receptor allows the entry of glucose into the myocardial cell. But in the diabetic state, not only is there more glucose that enters, but it is concomitantly associated with the entrance of more sodium. That overloads the cell, and a high energy pump has to be effectuated to create homeostasis of electrolytes within the cell. Concomitantly, that stress of the high ATP consumption pump leads to a biotransformation of fibroblasts. Fibroblasts that ordinarily lead to the production of erythropoietin, now they become pro-inflammatory cells. And that further augments stress, reduces the erythropoietin production. We already know that when these drugs are given, we see an increase in hematocrit, we see an increase in erythropoietin, and now when these drugs are given, we go back to steady state. That is at least one theory that I think is couched in biology and is an operative therapy that, again, is independent of glucose lowering per se. But what really made everybody think differently is when these data came out in August. This is from the DAPA-HF study with the pagliflozin. These data argued that not only was there a reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, but look at what happened. When one looked at the enrollment criteria that did not pre-specify the necessity for diabetes, whether with diabetes or without diabetes, there was a remarkable signal. And so now these drugs originally intended to affect glucose lowering, and oh, by the way, were associated with a reduction in new onset heart failure, now are demonstrating a therapeutic efficacy for symptomatic heart failure absent the presence of diabetes. This mechanism of action is completely unexplored, but the signal cannot be dismissed. It is such a strong signal that we are so tempted to begin implementation now, even though it's a single trial. It's one dose, once a day, no titration, virtually zero side effect. The original concerns about amputations were dismissed. There were no episodes of diabetic ketoacidosis. There's even data in patients older than 75 almost a perfect addendum to our armamentarium. We're waiting for more evidence. We have to be slow before we dramatically uptake this, but this may be the next big thing. This very intriguing editorial put in press by Deepak Bhatt and Dr. Brunwall 
really goes through the program development for these drugs, but importantly this, Dr. Braunwall has suggested to all of us that we now have a new foundational pillow in the treatment of heart failure. That would be a significant change from what we've been doing, and this is worth further discussion. What about for heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? Is that an area that we can talk about? Well, we know that there's some animal data, and this is an intriguing animal experiment, taking a DOCA salt model, feeding the animal salt, and then doing a nephrectomy, a uninephrectomized animal. That replicates the hef And then coming in with empagliflozin, you see the reversal of much of what we see in this phenotype. But what's very interesting is at necropsy in these animals, What's important is that when the SGLT2 inhibitor is added to either the uninephrectomized animal or the DOCA animal, there is significant reverse remodeling of this HEF-HEF phenotype, smaller myocytes. But it's not from a change in connective tissue because you see no change in connective tissue in the stains that are from E through H. And so it intrigues us enough that there's yet another trial being done and this is the Impera Preserve, trying to exploit the possibility that this class may be beneficial and have path when we look forward to seeing those data come forward. There's a final unanswered question, and this is about infiltrative diseases. And this is something that I remember seeing full well when I was a resident at Parkland with Dr. Wilson, when we would see amyloidosis and we would wring our hands because we knew what that meant. It's remarkable to think that we now have therapies that can treat what usually had been an overtly fatal disease. Remember that ETR amyloid starts with transthyretin made by the liver, ostensibly to transport thyroid hormone. And through a series of foldings from a tetramer to a dimer, it effectuates its functionality but occasionally misfolding occurs. And when the misfolding occurs, that leads to deposits. Particularly for the house officers, I want you to remember this. There's an important distinction between AL amyloid and TTR amyloid. AL amyloid is associated with a proliferation of plasma cells, a plasma cell dyscrasia or flank, frank multiple myeloma, whereas TTR is akin to the process I've just described. That is an important consideration. I'll develop that further. Also recognize that this is not quite as random as it appears to be. There's a genetic underpinning for amyloid, and the cycle starts with those amyloid conditions that predispose to neurologic conditions versus those that predispose to cardiac conditions. The V122I mutation is a substitute mutation is uniquely important in persons of African descent, up to and including about 4% of the contemporary African-American population. But the V30 is important as well for persons of Italian descent. And so it's not just African-Americans that have this proclivity. Persons of Italian descent and persons of Japanese descent have a similar circumstance. You see these images all the time. This first image I'm sharing with you is what we see at HEFPEF, what we've talked about earlier in this presentation. But we also know that there's another model that really is the prototype for amyloid. Vastly different. We see this thickening of the septum that is pathologic. We see thickening of the leaflets. If we continue this process, we have this new sign that has become quite important in contemporary echo labs where a myocardial strain is preserved here at the apex, the so-called bullseye sign, but reduced elsewhere. This really is one of the first steps that triggers us that there might be amyloid present. We know that looking at the late enhancement with cardiac MRI really does give us yet another tip that we might be dealing with an infiltrative process. We know that if we look at T1 mapping times, we can look uniquely at the extracellular volume. And when we see that that's increased, we know that too is consistent. When I was a house officer at Parkland, we would facilitate the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction with a PYP scan. So I smiled quite broadly 
when I saw the reemergence of PYP scans because I thought, well, I'm familiar with those. But in truth, this is a very important diagnostic step. It is 100% specific for TT or amyloid. Let me say that again, 100% specific for TT or amyloid provided the diagnostic ratios are achieved here between bone and myocardium. This is of the utmost importance for house officers and fellows that are doing these evaluations. You start with a clinical suspicion that amyloid might be present, a number of potential clues, carpal tunnel syndrome, macroglossia, dermatographia, a number of things. You then look for evidence of light chains. The light chains are positive. You're committed to go down a pathway that leads to biopsy, looking for the green birefringence using a Congo red stain. If the light chains are negative and you have this clinical suspicion, that's where a positive PYP scan can be so informative, leading to the discovery of ATTR, amyloid, genotyping if necessary, and then discrimination between a genetic variant versus wild type. And so this is really the correct way clinically to reconcile this diagnosis and to realize that depending on the point of action, we have a number of therapies that are currently available and more that are soon to be available that are quite effective in the treatment of this condition. There are three questions about amyloidosis that I want the house officers and the fellows to appreciate. How best to make the diagnosis? Clinical red flags, look for the monoclonal proteins, do the PYP scan, particularly if they're negative. Is endomyocardial biopsy always required? Only when there's ambiguity. If the monoclonal proteins are positive, then the biopsy is obligatory. What are the steps to need to institute therapy? Tefaminus is available now. We're using it on a regular basis in Chicago. It is incredibly expensive, $650 a day, a day. So one has to work with insurers, with the manufacturer to find these drugs and make them available. And remember that the unique cohorts are those in Italy, Northern Ireland, Japan, and of African descent. So what I've tried to do for you today is to review what I've called heart filling 2020, the unanswered questions. The first thing I wanted to do was remind you of where we are. There's effective guideline directed medical therapy. I've given you the app. We believe that prevention is reality. Secondly, I wanted to emphasize heart failure with preserved ejection fraction using a trial that ostensibly was negative and showing you how informative that trial is, how many new directions we can pursue. Right now, we have limited treatment options, maybe the aldosterone antagonist of the ARB. We don't know yet about the RNA compound. We are intrigued with these gender sex-based differences. They may inform other therapies that we have to consider. We have to understand that up to about 15% of HEFPEF may be due to an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. The same for critical AS with small volumes and low flow. And then finally, the SGLT2 inhibitors may be therapies for HEFPEF. I want to end with a thank you, but importantly, my thank you is based on this statement from Sir Isaac Newton. If I've had vision to do the things that I've done in my career, it's because I've been able to stand on the shoulders of giants, and this is the friendly giant that I know best.